Great to be at this historic campus, walk around and see some of the beautiful buildings, especially because this is China's National Day. <laughs> this is like the July 4th of China, October 1st, 1949, the establishment of the People's Republic. So I'm really happy to be here and talking about culture and soft power in China's foreign policy. And as you can tell by the uh, title there, we make the case that it's a very realist approach to culture and soft power. How many people in here have taken a, a course in international relations before, at least a course? Okay, that's, a, that's about what I thought based on what Miles is telling me. So I'll, I'll identify some terms here. Bottom line is, I think that the, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, which governs China as an authoritarian uh, state, would love it if blonde and red-haired people throughout the world would carry around signs saying, I love China. Uh, that's the objective of China's uh, soft power and culture strategy internationally. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of this for China's foreign policy in the future. It's really part of a broader project I'm doing, trying to read uh, what Chinese elites, intellectual, political, economic elites, are writing about what they think China will be like, what the world will be like, in the, uh, the next two decades. What sort of foreign and security policies this section is from should we expect from China up to the year about 2030 as its power continues to grow, as its economic power, its military power continue to grow? I mean, China is on a really rapidly ascending trajectory, so we want to be able to try to imagine how will it be behaving, what uh, sort of expectations should we have looking ahead, not just today, but looking ahead. So currently, um, outside of China in Western uh, international relations scholarship of China, Dominant debates on the future of Chinese foreign policy don't pay a lot of attention to the key factor that I'm really interested in, which is the identity of the Chinese state. Kind of how Chinese elites, whether again, economic or political, military elites, what they think about the personality and the mission and the purpose of their country, their state. That identity factor, I think, is really crucial to get a handle on if you want to know more about uh, China's trajectory. But ironically, not a lot of people out there working on China think in terms of identity. The, d the dominant debates on China's foreign policy derive from realism or neorealism in international relations and uh, so-called neoliberalism. I'm going to define a little bit about what that means in, in just a second. Point is, both of these approaches, neorealism and neoliberalism, hold identity constant by positing that all so-called normal states share in a common identity. They're all coherent, rational actors. All states are coherent, rational actors. So you don't really need neoliberals and neorealists say, you don't really need to study their identity. They're really at root all the same. So all you need to do, therefore, since China, like any other normal state they think is a rational actor, determine what, their national, what China's national interests will be in the next 20 years or so. And once you can do that, you can easily deduce what its foreign policy will be like. Now, this is kind of the approach I'm, I'm taking on, because there's really two problems with it. First of all, the rational actor is actually not demonstrated, that China is a rational actor in this way, isn't normally demonstrated. It's just assumed or imputed to the Chinese state. So instead of examining what the Chinese state is doing, its foreign policies on the ground, or what Chinese elites are writing and that kind of thing, it's just imputed. And then secondly, even more damning, neorealism and neoliberalism actually uh, differ on what kind of a rational actor the normal state is. Sounds kind of ironic. You would think if it's rational, it's rational. But they come to two very different conclusions about what it means to be rational. Neorealists say all normal states are suspicious, self-regarding, and amoral. All normal states, always, in every time and place, going back thousands of years even, realists say, are suspicious of each other. They only care about themselves, ultimately. They're amoral, always trying to maximize their own utility. And here's the key. They're determined to increase their power, their military power, their economic power, and their cultural power, or their soft power, relative, relative to the power of other states. They want to have more than other states. Uh, even at the risk of inviting costly conflict. So it's a competitive world where states are trying to increase all aspects of their power relative to other states. That's how neorealists see the world. And neorealist analysts of China impute this identity to the Chinese state. It's this kind of rational actor. Neoliberals, though, impute something very different. 
they impute the identity of an actor that's fully rational, but actually is predisposed to cooperate with other states in international society and to smooth over conflicts. Still rational, but the goal of these rational neoliberal states is to maximize their absolute utility through international interactions, okay, relative uh, uh, to the utility accrued not what other states are accruing, but to what they've had in the past or they, they would imagine by taking some other course of action. So imagine a trade agreement. Okay, if it's a neoliberal state uh, and it's thinking about negotiating uh, removal of tariff barriers with some other state, free trade agreement or something like that, Neoliberal state leaders will ask themselves, well, will, we, will we be better off relative to what we were in the past? Or then if we did not sign this free trade agreement, will we be better off? If so, let's do it. Let's sign it. But if it's a neo-real estate, its leaders will ask, now if we sign this free trade agreement, who's going to benefit more? Is it going to be us or our potential adversaries? And if it's going to be our potential adversaries, let's say in the US-China relationship, they really worry. Do we cooperate uh, by signing this free trade agreement? So cooperation is a whole lot more difficult if states have the identity of, uh, that neorealists impute to them. It's a lot more likely, though, cooperation is a lot more likely if states are actually neoliberal in behavior. So instead of imputing one or the other, as much of the debate has done in the last year, I want to actually examine the record, what Chinese elites are writing about future foreign policy. And I, I want to read what they write, especially in so-called Nebu or internal circulation only policy journals, which you can access certain places. Read what they're actually writing, go and interview them, and, and test this proposition. It's either neorealist or neoliberal. And that's what I want to talk about today. All right, this is important. And there's a few exceptions, uh, but I'm going to skip this point and go on to this one. Final point I want to make before getting to the actual content here. Uh, a, a number of writers in the 2000s, from about really 1999 or so, as China was negotiating its entry into the World Trade Organization, up until about the last year, when things changed pretty dramatically, were insisting that the Chinese state had this kind of neoliberal, cooperative uh, international <coughs> identity. But even to the extent that might have been true empirically, the question we have to ask is, was that simply a function of China's relative weakness at the time, relative to other states, relative to so-called international uh, structures? Because if neorealism was just a product of its weakness, then as China becomes stronger, as it's doing every day, we read in the papers all the time, then its future foreign policy may be one that abandons neorealism. So we can't uh, project from the present when China's power is constrained by structures such as, in the military sector, structures such as balance of power, the US-Japan alliance, security alliance, US-ROK security alliance, implicit alliance with Taiwan, that sort of thing. These are international structures that constrain and shape the way China can behave, and will also constrain and shape the way Chinese writers thinking about the future will present their ideas. They have to take into account this structural reality. Balance of power is a key element in the military sector. Also, so-called security regimes, like the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN-related regimes, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and so on. These sorts of regimes, and there are others, constrain Chinese state when it's relatively weak relative to those regimes. Economically, you know, China has to trade, has to export to continue to grow economically at such a rapid pace, 10% a year or so for the last 15 to 20 years and some fluctuation in that. World Trade Organization is a key trade regime which limits or has limited what China can do. So the point is, if China looked like a neoliberal state in the 2000s, in the late 90s to the 2000s, it might have been because China was weak relative to international structures like these. What happens, though, when you get uh, to the future years, the 2020s, 2030s, when China will presumably be a lot stronger relative to those regimes? Right, so it's a question of attribution. What do I identify uh, the kind of neoliberal behavior we saw in the 2000s to the identity of the Chinese state or to these structural variables? It's like if you've got a friend who's behaving in a certain way. Maybe your friend uh, you haven't known for a long time and they're starting to act a little strange with you. If you haven't known them for a long time, so you're not sure about the identity of your friend, they might not last as your friend very long and they start to act strange. You might think there's something about their character which is problematic. 
If, on the other hand, though, it's because something's happened in their environment to make them behave oddly for a while, you will be relatively reassured that it's not a core factor of their identity and they might get back on track and be friendly with you, right? It's the same kind of thing. You want to attribute behavior to states. Is it something about the situation or something about the identity? It's the structure that matters that's made China act in a neoliberal way in the 2000s. And again, as its power increases, maybe we won't see them acting in that the same way. On the other hand, if all along their identity has been more consistent with the cooperative identity of a neoliberal state than even as its power increases. By 2030, even if it's much more powerful than now, it might behave cooperatively with the United States and other countries. Now, to get at this, try to test which one it is, we're going to examine a policy sector that's relatively unstructured by uh, balance of power, international regimes, and that sort of thing, which is indeed culture management, flow of images, ideas, and values, and so on across borders, kind of soft power competition. There really isn't a world culture organization comparable to the World Trade Organization. You don't have alliances between the U.S. and Japan or the U.S. and South Korea and so on to try to shape cultural competition. It's relatively unstructured. You know, Ideas are circulating, states are putting images out, other actors are. So, so you can examine that to get a key. China's not really constrained in the cultural realm. You can examine its cultural policy, try to get a key for whether it's relatively neoliberal or not. So I examine policy debates in this area for clues as to the states, Chinese states' enduring identity. I'm not going to talk much about the method and all that, but here's the key question. Is the treatment of culture here in these Chinese writings? mostly in these internal circulation only journals and kind of other books and so on that they think only other Chinese people are reading. If I read that and they're relatively neoliberal, that gives me confidence that's the kind of identity we're talking about. If they're not, they're closer to a realist identity, then I think, well, that's probably what it is. And the core finding is overwhelmingly the identity is realist. When you read Chinese writings on culture and international relations. Uh, it stresses a dangerous competition culturally with other states or civilizations, uh, poles of power. They talk about this pole, that pole, a contest for relative cultural dominance. Over and over again, that's what you see. Almost all Chinese writers, literally almost all of them that I've been able to read, speak in adversarial terms uh, with uh, some sounding like offensive realists, and I'll give you a ex few examples of this in a minute, and others more like uh, defensive realists. And then there's a middle category, kind of empiricist, trying to measure relative soft power and so on. But you very rarely, occasionally, maybe one in 20 writers will sound like a neoliberal. The vast majority of people writing sound like, uh, sound like realists. Let me give you some examples and show you this interesting slide while I'm thinking. Oh, you can't see the source here. Here's like uh, a carefully photoshopped photograph celebrating China's National Day in 2007, year before the Olympics. People were very proud and so on. And this is a cartoon. You see, cartoon, this is from an educational uh, journal, like a trade journal of teachers, educators, and so on, emphasizing this, is, this means comprehensive national power. And a lot of the balloons here, the lan lanterns here, are showing these teachers what the key components of comprehensive national power are. Up at the top, I don't have a pointer here, the top, uh, the, the quality of the citizens, kind of the cultivation of the citizens, their nature. Uh, the impression, kind of cultural impression, image given off. Cultural industries, cultural resources, cultural creativity or innovation, and uh, the knowledge economy. And what this says is, this guy is telling his uh, colleague here, as teachers, what we really need to do is cultivate the Chinese people because these days, everybody recognizes this kind of cultural cultivation is a key component of comprehensive national power, along with military power and economic power. So in, in other words, again, stressing this kind of competition and adversarial relationship among states culturally. Let me just read you a few examples, OK? I'm going to put on my glasses so I can actually see now that the light's out. OK, first, in the category of offensive uh, realism in this regard, there's a book with an innocuous sounding title called Cultural Diplomacy, a Media Studies Interpretation by a philosopher teaching international relations at the Communication University of China, which teaches a, a lot of elite journalists. He, write, he writes that the primary reason that states manage culture policy and try to project culture abroad is, quote, to change other states, to infect 
affect and influence foreign people's beliefs and value preferences, to alter the target state's attitudes, decisions, and policies until finally they'll benefit our own state's national interest. Okay? And, uh, and then, again, this is, this is a kind of, this guy's teaching China's elite journalists, it's the Communication University of China. And he goes on and says, sometimes we have to, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he says, we have to stretch the truth. Here's a quotation. In order to maximize this effect, a state might conceal some unfavorable facts or even provide false information, which aims at enticing other states to focus, understand, and remember the points we are promoting while ignoring others. So teaching journalists, listen, you may have to lie sometimes to increase China's comprehensive national power in the cultural realm. And then finally, he says, we, we do want to learn from foreigners, though. We don't want to shut ourselves off. And he says, quote, I love this quote, we must learn the barbarians' advantageous techniques for the purpose of checking the barbarians. You know, shi yi chang ji, yi zhi yi. It's, uh, you know, barbarians is a terminology used to describe inner it's, it's really kind of fun to read. They don't think foreigners are ever going to read this stuff, right? It's not the kind of thing they would tell you in an interview, unless they were joking with you. Then here's a second example. Uh, two scholars, uh, uh, Pan Zhongqi and Huang Renwei of uh, Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences published an article a couple of years ago called uh, China's Geocultural Strategy. You know what geopolitics is? Kind of deep competition among states taking geographical factors, power centers, and so on into account. Basically, divides the world into a number of civilizations, and he says that uh, there are culturally weak zones in the world, in Africa, Latin America, and Central Asia. These, these areas, he says, they say, urgently need to strengthen their own culture's special characteristics, and, but they can't do it on their own. In order to contest American cultural hegemony, they must borrow from other more advanced cultures. And they, they say China's cultures, the Chinese culture's great capacity and relative acceptability can provide an important basis for these countries to strengthen their own cultures and resist. Basically, they see Central Asia, Latin America, and Africa as culturally weak zones uh, in which China can expand its influence. Those people will welcome that because they don't want to be dominated by the United States. China will be able, in its competition with the U.S., to win over these areas culturally. And let me give you one more example, then, of kind of an offensively realist approach to this. Well, yeah, this is an interview did an interview with somebody in, in Beijing at a, a think tank there. And he said his argument was that in the future, there might not be as many hot wars in superpower competition, but there will still be uh, an intense competition in the realm of culture, which China will be in a good position to win relative to the United States. The reason for that, he says, is because China is uh, on a, the, the U.S., the U.S. is perceived as too selfish, arrogant, and presumptuous. China is not, and he says its low-key posture will give it a real advantage in soft power competition with the U.S. in the future. And he goes on to say that because China's system is an authoritarian system, its leaders can afford to take the long view. It doesn't have to, they don't have to worry about constantly reacting to the whims of public opinion. They can take a, a relatively cool, level-headed approach to foreign affairs and can appeal to the desire of people throughout the world for reasonableness. So there's a whole lot of other examples I can have of characterizing the cultural realm in these competitive terms, thinking China can secure certain advantages over the United States and other. Then let me just give you uh, uh, an example of uh, kind of defensive realism. Okay? This is like Chinese uh, elites who understand there's a s intense cultural competition with the United States in particular, but they're worried that China might lose. They're on the defensive. Here is an article by uh, two people uh, at a conference organized by the People's Liberation Army, PLA, on culture and national security in December 2006 in Beijing. Here's a, one line from one paragraph from, um, from a couple of authors. They, they're identifying a list of threats to China culture. And one of the poisoning of Chinese culture that is intentionally pursued by the West. The authors quote without citation a purported CIA document that proclaims a strategy, and here they're quoting, allegedly, the CIA document. The strategy is to do our utmost to use materialism to entice and spoil China's youth, encourage them to belittle, denigrate, and more openly oppose China's ideology, cultivate their interest in pornography, 
and provide them with the opportunities to consume it. This is in a CIA document, right? Further encourage them to engage in licentious sexual behavior. Make them no longer consider superficiality and vanity to be uh, shameful. Destroy the spirit they formerly emphasized of perseverity in the face of adversity. Perseverance in the face of adversity. So attributing intentionality to the United States, almost always without any real citations to show where this CIA document may have come from. The United States is out to subvert China culturally and has to compete. Okay, so those are some examples of kind of offensive and defensively realist approaches. Now, what does it all add up to? Let me just conclude by giving you a couple examples of actual projections of the future related to culture by uh, some scholars I've read in this uh, larger project. One is uh, Li Jidong of the People's Liberation Army. Argues the key problem is how to make Confucianism's inherent intelligence and attractiveness serve our country's development strategy and national interests. Now, if you know anything about Confucianism, the notion of using Confucianism to achieve some objective is anathema to Confucius. You don't, in a utilitarian sort of way, use something to achieve selfish ends in Confucius. You're supposed to not be selfish like that, play a proper social role, and so on. So already from the start, this is antithetical to Confucianism. But so is this. Uh, this is uh, Jia Qingwing, chairman of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Consultative Conference, unveiling a statue of Confucius during the inauguration of the Confucius Institute for Business in London in October 2006. Now, Confucius Institutes are funded by the Chinese government to try to spread Chinese soft power and cultural influence, maybe mostly language training and so on like that. Others worry that eventually it'll, they will become avenues of propaganda dissemination. But the notion of there being Confucius Institute of Business, Confucius did not like the idea of people pursuing their selfish interests. The idea of competing with each other to secure profit in a market would have been bizarre, completely immoral to Confucius. So would Jia Qingling, rumored to be a very corrupt senior leader, he's clearly a senior leader of the Chinese Communist Party, rumored to be extremely corrupt, avaricious, and so on. The notion that this guy would introduce uh, a, a bust of Confucius opening. It's just hilarious and appalling. And Confucius would be, of course, rolling over uh, in his grave figuratively. But it's all about we'll use whatever cultural resources we have at our disposal these days to increase our relative power to the United States and others. How do we contest the West, especially America's so-called discourse hegemony? The realism that they promote now constitutes the mainstream of international political culture. So these Chinese writers perceive that the world can sometimes be dangerous and competitive, but they say it's because America and the West are promoting that kind of culture, whereas Chinese culture is inherently harmony-oriented and peace-oriented, and it's rooted in, uh, in Confucianism. Would it be possible, then, for China's inherently benevolent culture to ascend and become international political culture's mainstream? That's the objective. That's the goal. But there's no recognition here, of course, that all of this itself, this whole strategy, uh, reveals a kind of uh, certainly not harmonious, not Confucian, adversarial relationship with other powers, that kind of view of the world. There's no real awareness, at least in the writing, that uh, this is ironic and inconsistent. And then finally, these two writers, also from the PLA, identifying three expected stages in China's rise. Looking ahead, first of all, this one is kind of obvious and not, not so exciting. China will construct a secure surrounding environment, developing strategic partnerships with various neighboring countries, and sometimes playing a leading role in ASEAN, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That's, that's because China, the reason this isn't so exciting or ambitious is because China, these authors recognize, is still actually quite weak today. There's only so much it can do. It wants to defend itself and so on has to vigorously guard, though, in this stage, which goes to about the 2020, 2020 or so, next decade, guard against Tibetan and Uyghur independence, try to stabilize relations with Taiwan and not allow it to split apart, apart from the fatherland. It's for the next decade. Second stage, though, uh, I lost the Chinese characters here, 2020 to 2035 requires China to move beyond the Asian region try to mold a global security environment beneficial to China's interests. This is a kind of active, initiative-taking posture, chiefly exemplified by expanding our international space 
and realizing the unification of our fatherland. In a number of different places, you can read Chinese writers saying that in the 2020s, we will solve the Taiwan problem. And I, I've actually, we had at USC just a couple of weeks ago, we had visitors from a, a government think tank. And we had kind of a private lunch. There were three or four of us on, on the USC side and three or four of them who were visiting. And it was in a private room, so after the lunch, we were able to speak kind of freely. And I, 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 the way I got at this was a little bit backwards. I asked, I said to them, you know, it's amazing. A lot of Americans are really naive. They don't realize that you guys are, in, are absolutely committed to unifying Taiwan in about the 2020s. Can you believe it? They don't really believe that? You think you're willing to tolerate the status quo indefinitely? And the leader of this group said, how could they not believe it? We've said it over and over again. We'll unify Taiwan. He admitted to me. I don't think he realized he was saying it. He effectively admitted it. We're going to do it in the 2020s. That's when we're going to try it. Okay, so he said it, and he said he laughed at these naive Americans who don't believe it. That's what he said. And you can see a lot of people uh, writing about this, too. The 2020s, we realize the unification of the fatherland. Then in the third stage, after that's completed, as China's power continues to grow, after 2035, China will plan and operate a new international and uh, political and economic order that can universally be accepted by international society. Okay, we can say that the so-called plan and operate stage will be the highest level of China's peaceful rise. China's national interests will be fundamentally fused with the global interest. Sometime in this period after 2035, China will surpass the United States, they believe, in comprehensive national power. That's when China will be in a position, they think, uh, to do this. China will profoundly lead and guide, after 2035, the international situation's direction of development. Especially important is that China will develop its discourse power, its soft power, its cultural power, and will cultivate influence over the world's direction of development with respect to culture and values, as a result, obtain universal world respect. And these writers are particularly straightforward and colorful, but a, a lot of writers speak in these terms. A lot of writers. It's not at all uncommon. This is not an unrepresentative sample in the least of the writing you see in China on the international future. So what are the implications? What should we uh, draw from this? Let's debate them. I'm not going to try to spell them out. I just think we should debate them, keeping in mind that although States' identity may be a realist, even offensively realist, if you read their writings, it certainly seems to be. China is still now, and presumably in the future, will still be constrained to some degree by international structures, by alliance structures, by regimes, and so on like that, shaping its rise as it continues to rise. So what they're writing now isn't destiny necessarily. It depends on how strong the international structures remain relative to uh, China's power as it continues to rise. So why don't I stop there? I wanted to leave plenty of time for uh, discussion. Yeah, that sounds about right, about a half an hour. Why don't we talk now? And you, I'll put a map on the board while we uh, discuss this. What do you think is going to happen? What, do you, what would you like to say? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, Dave Kong is a colleague of mine in the same department, School of International Relations at USC. He's a great, I just actually exchanged an email with him this morning. He's a great guy, I like him a lot, but he comes to exactly the opposite conclusion, what I do. And I, I think he's wrong. He's very optimistic. He, you're right, he pays attention to soft power, but he really believes that uh, as China rises, it will be a completely benevolent force and writing that, the article originally, I think, appeared in 2003, and then his book, Making This Argument in 2007, argued that all the Asian states around China would bandwagon with the rise of China, would go along enthusiastically with the rise of China, and would not balance, try to balance against China's rise. He argued that balancing is a European Western concept. So he predicted you would not see Asian states try to balance against China's rise. But look at what happened just the last year. Even then, people said that's not right. A lot of Asian states are hedging against China's rise. But just in the last year, I'm sure you know, Secretary of State Clinton visited Hanoi in July and articulated fairly obvious support for the um, 
states of Southeast Asia who are also claimants. You probably know China claims most of the South China Sea. Secretary and has putting, putting, been putting a lot of pressure on especially Vietnam in the last couple of years, military actual uh, pressure in the South China Sea. So Secretary Clinton said, the United States has a national interest in seeing a multilateral negotiated solution to the South China Sea disputes free of coercion. She used the term national interest. That's because some Chinese officials had told American officials in March that China's claim to the South China Sea, which again goes all the way down here, is now a core national interest comparable to its claim to Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang. It never used this terminology before. The South China Sea claim is a core national interest. So Secretary Clinton came back with our national interest is in a solution that is negotiated multilaterally free of coercion. When you think about that, any negotiated multilateral solution free of coercion means that the Philippines, which claims part of the South China Sea, would get a part. Vietnam would get a part. Brunei, maybe even Taiwan, these are all claimants. If they're negotiating free of Chinese coercion, and it's a multilateral negotiation, they're going to get a part of the South China Sea. So Secretary Clinton was effectively saying, we will deny you the realization of your core national interest there. And you know, then so in that respect, I think they, and, and Vietnam and Indonesia took the initiative in trying to get Secretary Clinton to make that statement at an ASEAN summit in Hanoi. So it looked pretty obviously like at least these Southeast Asian states, Philippines too, trying to balance against China's rise, right? They're mo trying to bring the United States even more forcefully into the region, play this kind of diplomatic role. That's balancing. So, and of course, you saw what happened in the last week with the China and the fishing boat collision uh, near the Senkaku Islands, which Japan has controlled for a long, over 100 years. You saw, probably read a little bit about that. It looks like my friend Dave Kong is just wrong. <laughs> and we, we're going to be on the same panel at an Association for Asian Studies meeting, actually, hopefully, in Hawaii in March. And I'm going to tell him there he's wrong, too, politely, because he's a nice guy. Yes. Actually, I think that's a great question. And I hadn't really thought about it from that angle, even though I wrote a book sort of dealing with some of those kind of related topics a few years ago. Yeah, I said that relative to other sectors, like military competition or economic competition, cultural competition is relatively unconstrained by structures. But you're right. There's actually kind of a global cultural norm that prefers states to be democratic these days, right? Sort of democ democratic countries are considered the norm. That's kind of a global cultural structure. So the fact China is still an authoritarian communist state violates that global norm. And you're right, that should put pressure on it. Uh, what you see, though, is in China a real belief that if we increase our economic and military power, we can reshape global cultural norms so that it's no longer considered abnormal for a state to be communist. But I think you're right. Uh, that's going to be a tense and difficult thing to do, because it clearly makes a lot of neighboring countries and others worried about China and suspicious of China. That's a good point. Yes? On the surface, at least, publicly, China is very nice to Islam and says all the things that uh, Islamic leaders around the world would like to hear. But you probably know that up in the northwestern part of China, Xinjiang near Arumshi, that city up there, a uh, mostly Muslim uh, minority population up there is, has extremely hostile, tense relationships with the ethnically Han Chinese people who have migrated there mostly in the last few decades and dominate the region. Just last July, July 2009, there was uh, an uprising by the Uyghur Muslims. So a lot of Uyghur Muslims, especially in the city of Arumshi, but also in a couple of other cities, where they uh, just massacred some poorer Chinese migrant workers. 
And then, of course, the Chinese government came down with brutal repression back and forth, back, back in response to that. And there was a back and forth since then. There's a lot of tense uh, tension in the air. There's a lot of hostility. But officially, uh, and, and of course, China from very early on after September 11, 2001, joined with the United States, formally at least, in being a member of the War on Global Terror, cooperating with that. China would worry about Islamic fundamentalism. In fact, it's also founded a so-called Shanghai Cooperation Organization with Russia, Kazakhstan, other states in Central Asia. One of their objectives is to oppose religious fundamentalism because a lot of those states in Central Asia are worried about Islamic fundamentalism. So it's, it depends on the specific situation. China clearly tries to not get ahead of the curve and be visibly seen as opposed to Muslim ambitions throughout the world. But uh, on the ground in Xinjiang, it's actually a very, very brutal toward that population. Yes? I think it's possible. Um, I mean, we're talking about um, so many years from now, it would be really difficult to say yes, certainly, or even, even uh, put probability on it. But if you were to project forward China's GDP growth of the past 30 years into the next 30 years, 9 to 10% annual GDP growth, then China would surpass the United States in total economic output, GDP, sometime in the late 2020s. Probably, though, you can't project forward. I mean, all countries, when they reach a certain level, start to grow more slowly than they were able to grow before. I just saw an Asian Development Bank report uh, mentioned in a Financial Times article a few days ago, predicting that for the next 20 years, China's GDP growth, instead of being 9 to 10 percent, would only be 5.5 percent. Some people, annually, I mean, some people think it will be even slower than that. There's a lot of economic problems in China just underneath the surface. They've got a real bad property bubble that's developed. They're deeply reliant on exports to grow the economy at a time when the global economy is slowing down again. So I kind of agree with you that uh, a lot of this might be overly ambitious. The growth rate's going to slow and so on. And the other possibility is that even in, in order to achieve this kind of in order to achieve faster growth and consolidate that kind, of, uh, that kind of rise, it will have to maintain cooperation with other states. And so over time, kind of leaders who end up rising to the top in China will be leaders who are more predisposed to cooperate with other countries, especially some who were trained in the United States or Western Europe or, some, or Australia, someplace like that. That in other words, uh, the leaders in China now were trained in the Soviet Union back in the 1950s. Right? And those who were, who were not trained in the Soviet Union were trained in kind of Soviet-style conditions in China a little bit later. Once you get to 20 years out, possibly a lot of the Chinese elite will have trained in the United States. And they'll have a different outlook on the world. You know, they'll, have a, uh, they'll understand, possibly, that China is inherently a part of the world and has to be cooperative. So we can't project forward and know exactly what's going to happen. But, but I still think it makes a difference. When you read these writings, what people are saying now in China is this is going to happen, that's going to happen. It influences their expectations for what the future will hold, influences their current behavior in a way that is inconsistent with what we would hope if we want a more cooperative world. That's the thing. That's the thing I really focus on. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, sir, what, could you maybe flesh out a little more what the content is of the, of the book of power? I mean, you mentioned Confucianism. I was thinking about Confucius' movie. It, uh, no, I heard it was a disaster, actually. Yeah, I was yeah. curious. And, and presumably, the, the cultural content you're trying to export is not orthodox, Maoist, revolutionary ideology. Right. So is this something more like that Asian value stuff you were seeing out of Singapore? Or is it something, I'm just curious if you could just say what, what exactly is in there that they're trying to spread across the world? They're actually trying to scramble and decide what that will be uh, themselves. But a lot of it is the so-called Asian values notion, the notion that uh, Democracy 
a la what we have in the United States or in Western Europe or Japan, isn't the end of history. There are other possible futures that uh, are authoritarian. I think probably a lot of people in China, in the Chinese Communist Party at least, would like to see China become like Singapore, only on a continental scale. So an authoritarian state, but that's a lot more efficiently run, that isn't as corrupt, where people generally accept the, the order. They're a long way away from that right now, of course, but I think it's probably the objective. But when I showed you the slide, the cartoon slide, right, those are the components. I think if we can have healthy culture industries, in other words, if our films start competing with Hollywood films and television programs worldwide, that will increase our cultural power. Uh, if we have, uh, if our information industries are really well developed, so our telecommunications and computer industries, if they're exporting telecoms equipment and that kind of thing around the world, that's going to be great. Software design, all of those kind of things. But when, but that's, it's a really good point, because when you actually ask people there, what would be the content of the alternative you're presenting, they don't really have much of an answer. And it relates to this, this gentleman's question about cultural constraints. Now, they don't know exactly what they'll replace those global cultural norms with. They just know they don't like them because they're Western. And those cultural norms uh, arose in connection with the rise of Western power in the last few hundred years. And you can understand why a lot of people in China would not like Western power. They were victimized by Western and especially Japanese power a century ago, around a century ago. So they assume that what's prevalent globally now, global democratic norms and so on, is really just a hypocritical mask for American or European power. So they don't like it, but they don't really know what they want to replace it with yet. Yes? Yeah, 2020, it's not uh, like a magical, it's in, around in the 2020 sometime. They don't literally say, you know, January 1st, 2020 or something. I think they think, you'll probably study this in other classes, they think they'll be able to achieve the kind of regional, local military superiority or even supremacy that allows them to, if the United States wants to send assets in there, take them out, like with carrier killing missiles or something like that, raise the cost to the United States to the level that um, if they would, I mean, from what I've read, you probably heard this too, you certainly would know about this. Uh, what people in the United States and elsewhere think the strategy is for China is they would launch some sort of decapitation strike on Taiwan, take out the communications, uh, the uh, power and so on and so forth, that kind of thing. Meanwhile, they will have cultivated allies and proxies in Taiwan who, once the, the attack begins, will come forward and say, we do not want American help. We don't want to be a battleground here. Let's sue for peace. Let's accept status uh, like Hong Kong as a special administrative region. Let's not invite the Americans in. It's a disaster. We're in flames right now. Then the Americans, the thinking goes, would be deterred from coming in, too, because in the meantime, China will have established uh, extraordinary military capability compared to what they have today there and especially would be able to remove American aircraft carrier battle groups they were sent in. So that's kind of what strategy is. So they don't really ask, you know, will the world accept this or not? They see this as a fundamental mission of the Chinese nation, achieving reunification. I think Taiwan is essentially, inherently, eternally a part of China. So they really don't care what the rest of the world thinks. Right? They don't worry about that. They worry about how can we, I mean, they like it if the, they, they make the argument that the rest of the world could accept it, but even if it doesn't, they're determined to do it anyway. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. So you said how uh, the Chinese um, don't necessarily like the Western ideas and methods for economic political institutions, um, mm -hmm. but it seems like the undervaluation of currency and um, the Confucian Institute for Business seems to reflect more Western capitalistic It relates to that quotation from the, the book on cultural diplomacy. Let's study the barbarians' advanced techniques and use them against the barbarians to check them. They don't reject all Western cultural influence. They want to accept those things from the West that will increase China's power, but reject those things that would undermine Communist Party's authoritarian control over society. So that's what it really boils down to. But I think you're right to point to an irony there, right? Because it's hard to find the boundary. You know, if they 
reel in a little Western culture here and a little there, before you know it, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole society might be denatured and becoming like Westerns are. But, but they're acutely <laughs> aware of that. And that's why they rigorously police the internet and in other ways try to keep out too much uh, pernicious Western influence. They're aware of that tension, but they still might not be able to, to defeat it in the end. Yes? Will they be able to keep control over the country then? You said what, what kind of behavior? Uh, just kind of this, I think you're getting a lot of examples of kind of uh, uh -huh. adversarial oh, uh, I see. publications where you know, they're kind of <coughs> wide producing. Yeah. I think uh, they can effectively, you know, these kinds of publications up without, I guess, if, uh, you know, they can do full truth. Hmm. Good question. Well, it's, um, there's a race on, right? Uh, can the Chinese Communist Party acquire the surveillance technology and other tools of monitoring and repressing society faster than people in society can acquire the technologies to subvert that repression, right? So far, it appears the Chinese Communist Party is winning. There was a news story just a couple of weeks ago, a city, I can't remember what, it was near Hangzhou here, somewhere down there. City is actually installing. Um, did you see this? Did you see this one? City is installing cameras in every taxi cab in the city. So they could film every, the people in every taxi ride. And actually, Beijing experimented with this just before the Olympics and during the Olympics. Allegedly, at least, every taxi cab in Beijing was outfitted with a microphone, and allegedly, every conversation was recorded or monitored in every taxi cab. You know how subversive people can be when they're riding in a taxi, taxi drivers themselves are great sources of information and so on. So, you know, and there were something, there were hundreds of thousands of, clo of uh, cameras set up all through Beijing during the Olympics. There's allegedly even a plan to, and I haven't seen anything about this in a few years, so I don't know if it's true or not, to, to launch something like 84, I think it was, uh, low-flying satellites. So not in the geosynchronous orbital belt, but low-flying satellites so that every square inch, basically, of Chinese territory could be monitored uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that if there is a demonstration that develops in a square somewhere in Sichuan or something, immediately this would, somebody at a, a, a computer console would see this, they'd be able to send security forces there to repress it. So I don't know. I mean, we don't, there's a race on. There's right now no, absolutely zero organized political opposition in China. Kind of astonishing country with as high a per capita income as it has now, there's no organized political opposition. Even if a few people came together to try to form a political society, they would be arrested. Can't do it. So if you have a powerful, economically powerful regime outfitted with the latest technology that a lot of American firms have helped supply them, and now they're capable of developing on their own, adamantly committed to building this kind of new state, then maybe they will succeed. Maybe they'll succeed. Let's go back over here. Yeah. How do you think the, the relations between China and Japan are ultimately going to affect China's rise? How, like, what is China's perspective on that, considering they see Japan as a Western dominated country? Yeah, that's been very tense, obviously, for years, especially in the last couple of weeks. The way the uh, uh, dispute over the fishing vessel was resolved really hasn't been resolved. Japan, you probably know about this, right? Chinese fishing, you know all about that, yeah. Uh, you know, they, there's still a lot of acrimony between the two sides. Uh, Japan, there's still, at least as of yesterday when I last read the news, uh, four Japanese in detention in China were apparently taken hostage, right, in, re in reprisal for this. So it doesn't look good. I think, um, I think that a lot of people in China would like to put Japan in its place. Right? Not everybody. I mean, in Japan, is, Chinese people love Japanese products. Like, everybody in the world loves Japanese products, right? A lot of tourists go there, a lot of students and so on, but they're, they're not normally in the PLA and making security and foreign policy toward Japan. Those people seem quite hostile uh, to Japan. There's even speculation among some that China would like to take control of the Ryukyu Islands, including Okinawa. 
right? Because they feel themselves strategically hemmed in. This is just speculation. There's no writing that I've seen on this, but some speculation. Oh, yeah, because first of all, Japan only annexed those islands in the 1870s. And before then, they had paid tribute both to the Qing Empire in China and to the southern Japanese daimyo. Okay, so uh, they, uh, a lot of people in China will tell you, in fact, I, I'll tell you, <laughs> I visited Taiwan in May of 2009. You probably know Taiwan is uh, under Kuomintang, KMT uh, administration again, after many years, uh, eight years under administration of a, a party that wants independence from China. Now it's under kind of a mainlander China, mostly mainlander Chinese uh, administration. And I talked with this guy who's actually a senior figure in KMT foreign policy making, who harangued me for 90 minutes, saying that everybody knows that the Ryukyu Islands belong to China. And when China and Taiwan unify, which will be very soon, he said, we will take back the Ryukyu Islands. And the United States will go along with it because he said, because in 1969, when Nixon said he would, the United States administered those islands from 1945 until 1972. When Nixon announced he was giving them back, he said, we're restoring Japanese administrative authority over the Yukus. Nixon did not say, we're restoring sovereignty. So this guy seized on that and said, you see, the United States never recognized Japanese sovereignty over those islands. Actually, the reason Nixon did that was because the United States never claimed sovereignty over them. So we will administer them from 1945 until we decide to no longer miss. This guy was adamant, and he was in Taiwan, right? So I, I can imagine there are people in China who it would be very hard for them to take the nuclear line. I think probably people in Japan, though, are starting to worry about that, especially because, as I understand it, only Okinawa, basically, is defended militarily. There's a military presence there. A lot of those other islands in the archipelago don't have any regular military presence. And so I think people in Japan are alarmed about that and now thinking of ways they can beef up Okinawa, ok, uh, Ryokyo, Leocho or Ryukyu security. Follow up? Uh, where do you think that, at what point do you think the United States is going to have to step in, if ever? And on what policy side do you think the United States would enter with China or Japan? Well, the United States has a security alliance with Japan. Right. And uh, last week, during the fracas over uh, the, the fishing vessel, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Gates, uh, and several other U.S. officials reaffirmed that uh, the United States, well, it's tricky because the United States doesn't take a position on who has sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. But the security treaty with Japan covers any territory that Japan currently administers. Secretary Gates and Clinton and so on said last week that, uh, therefore, you know, implied last week, therefore, they, they said we will, we will meet our security commitments to Japan. And I can't remember, I should have looked up the exact terminology, made it clear that should this lead to military conflict, the United States would absolutely side with Japan over the same country, let alone Okinawa. Of course the United States would, uh, so, so clearly the U.S. is trying, whether it's <laughs> Secretary Clinton and Hanoi regarding the South China Sea or the comments last week, deter, or, you know, the um, military exercises with South Korea after the sinking of the South Korean vessel last March, clearly trying to deter China. This is part of in, an international structure that could shape China, balancing against it, sending its signals, letting it know you must behave in this way, other the otherwise the cost will be really high. That's the way international structures can shape uh, China's behavior as it rises. But I think the United States is very committed to Japan, no question about it. Yeah, really good question. I think, uh, of course, different Chinese people would have different takes on things, but there would certainly, uh, certainly be uh, uh, an effort by people in some quarters to blame this on outsiders. In any country, you would see that. If things go wrong internally, some people always want to blame outsiders. Um, it would depend on exactly how the implosion took place. If it was because the United States put tariffs on Chinese goods because of the currency dispute, and that led to a rapid fall off in Chinese exports, and then that led to sinking GDP growth in China, then that would be obviously something they could blame on the United States. If, on the other hand, it's they mismanage monetary expansion and suddenly the housing bubble starts to collapse, 
Some people might want to blame that on the West, but it would be a little bit more difficult to do. I'm actually reading right now uh, some materials I gathered last summer, Chinese economists debating causes of the financial crisis and what, what might happen. Those people are pretty level-headed. Those people aren't like a lot of these fire breathers who comment on international relations. They, of course, some of them are nationalistic. They blame the United States and they don't like currencies, but they, they really recognize that most of China's economic problems are of China's own creation. They're kind of in a bind for a variety of reasons. So, so it wouldn't be the economists and the policymakers so much. It would be, and it, wouldn't, it may not be immediately the economy tanks and let's blame the United States. It would be two or three steps iterations down the road. Then you get some social turmoil maybe, then you get, you get dissent in the political elite, and then you could see some of that kind of thing. It would definitely be unsettling if the economy tanks, no question about that. Whether it would lead to a more cooperative China internationally than we've seen the last year or so, or to an even less cooperative China internationally is the big question. Yes? Well, I think the United States already benefits a lot from China's rise economically. There's a lot of America, a huge number of American firms invested in China, and a lot of trade. We get all kinds of inexpensive and increasingly high quality products as a result of uh, China's economic development. We get to travel there and trade and, so, and uh, study there and so on. So there's already a lot of benefit. And clearly, if that kind of engagement leads to new generations of Chinese <coughs> leaders who become fundamentally more cooperative in their orientation to the outside world, that would be to everyone's benefit. You know, if you have another center of wealth uh, in, in Asia that's trading cooperatively and harmoniously with its neighbors, and with it, that's all to the good. Um, but we don't know if that's what this will lead to. Right? It could lead to an economically powerful but hostile China. And that seems to be the current path. I mean, there's, there's multiple trends going on at the same time, but just in the last year we've seen a lot seen uh, a lot of Chinese leaders feeling like they're not getting enough respect. They're going to finally stop putting up with that kind of nonsense and become more assertive. That's what we've seen for, since the Olympics, I think, in, in uh, summer of 2008. The one thing that really worries me is when I read these writers, there's a, a belief that, it's usually implicit, eventually the West will be wise enough to go along with our rise and accept our demands. It relates to the Taiwan question. Eventually, they'll accept us. They have no choice as our power increases and so on. And, and they're pretty smart and they can be reasoned with and we can use Confucius Institutes and those kind of things to shape their perspective of us and let them know we really mean business to the extent they'll accept our rise and not block it. So I worry that they are sort of blinded to a lot of the negative things people see about China and a lot of the worries people have, not just in the United States, but throughout Asia. I've interviewed people in China who really believe, people who are specialists, for example, on Southeast Asia. Well, they have no problem with us whatsoever. They like us in Southeast Asia because we're trading with them and so on. They, they, and these are Southeast Asia specialists. They don't really get, they haven't been able to live in Southeast Asia for a long period of time. They go there for conferences and so on. Like they, they really hear what they want to hear, though, when they go there. So I really worry that people in China aren't aware uh, of the way the outside world often perceives China. And they focus, I mean, this happens in the United States too, of course. We think everybody loves us, right? So we're shocked and appalled. Wow, you mean these people here don't like us? That's outrageous. You see that in China five times as much as you see here because they, they haven't had that much international experience as we've had now for a century. And they really fundamentally can't appreciate how feared they are in some quarters or around China. If people say they're worried about China, they, they assume they're immoral, or they're out to stop China's rise or split China. They, they really have a hard time thinking empathetically how others are receiving them. Not every individual, but when it comes to decision making by the, the state elites, you see that kind of thing. Well, you were going to ask something or make a comment? Okay. Right. Do they not um, have a realistic view of how they're viewed as in the 
of saving human rights? And that platform, do they not think that how they're scaring other nations, like you say, with the rise of how they treat like the weaker population? And I know Tiananmen Square is still following them politically. Mm -hmm. um, do they just believe that that's a Western idea that if, if other nations like India for um, nuclear testing or like the protection of the poor people doing like the, the Cancel Island thing? All right, right, right. They know that uh, it hurts their image to be seen repressing people's human rights. But, uh, and then they used to really worry about that. Uh, and they go out, out of their way to argue that we have a different concept of human rights here. We believe in the collective rights of over individual rights, or the right of China to rise uh, over uh, any other consideration. But they don't worry about it so much that they're not willing to just crush any organized opposition. And, and legitimate it uh, by saying that we're not Western. And those people are trying to under, these human rights actors are, are trying to undermine China and weaken it and so on and so forth. They appeal to the Asian values movement and so on. And they really think what it comes down to, they think as our power increases, they'll accept our human rights policies because the West is hypocritical and avaricious. And all they want to do is trade with us and make money off China. And in the end, they don't care about Chinese human rights. In the end, they'll be willing to go along with it. And you know, guess what? It kind of looks like they're right, right? If you look at uh, Western policies, how many Western states are willing to really take a stand for Chinese human rights? Not too many. In the end, they don't want a bad relationship with China. They want to be able to benefit from the trade. So I think that's the policy. That's the approach they take.